this is more than just an arson. This was a targeted act of uh, intimidation. Was arson and vandalism at a North York deli an act of terror? Tonight, a Jewish-owned business targeted the Coles for a federal investigation. Good evening. The blaze broke out at International Delicatessen Foods last week. Condemned as a deliberate act of hate, now local leaders want it investigated as a possible act of terrorism. CTV Janice Golding joins us live from Steeles Avenue West with the latest on this story. Janice. Hi, Michelle. The arson here at IDF on Steeles Avenue West is the latest attack on a Jewish-owned business in our city. And two local politicians are saying this crossed the line from hate crime into terrorism. Outside a Jewish-owned business that was set ablaze last week, harsh words of condemnation for the federal and provincial governments. We need them to step up and treat this as a serious, incredible uh, attack on civility and peace and order in Toronto. They need to get engaged. They can't be sitting in the sidelines. International Delicatessen Foods, also known as IDF, the same initials used for the Israel Defense Forces, was deliberately set on fire last week. The words Free Palestine spray painted on its back doors. And while Toronto police investigate this arson as a hate crime, Deputy Mayor Mike Cole and Councillor James Pasternak say the federal government needs to investigate this as an act of terror. Our suggestion here is for the other levels of government to consider this as a terrorist act and put the appropriate resources behind it to support Toronto Police Services. According to the Criminal Code of Canada, terrorism is defined as an act committed in whole or in part for a political, religious or ideological purpose, objective or cause, and with the intention of intimidating the public or a segment of the public with regard to its security, including its economic security. This store and the other stores that were targeted uh, downtown there, what on earth do these small retail outlets have to do with the war in Gaza? They have Jewish owners, and that's why they're being targeted. They have absolutely nothing to do with conflicts in the Middle East. Jamie Kersner Roberts, VP at the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs, says Sija is grateful to Councillors Cole and Pasternak, saying she hopes to see more politicians from every level of government enforce the law to prevent these acts of hate from continuing. Adding, if the evidence shows this was indeed an act of terror, we expect the police and justice system to treat it as such. Today, the councillors called this incident at IDF a tipping point. When you're trying to basically send a a chill, a, a message of intimidation to every Jewish person that owns a business in Toronto saying that you could be next. And the deputy mayor says he's written the federal and provincial governments asking them to become engaged but has yet to receive a response. The councillors also say they want the government, or the federal government that is, to update and change what they call feeble and outdated legislation as relates to hate crimes to give Toronto police more power to investigate and act. Reporting live, I'm Janice Golding. Now back to Michelle and Nathan. All right, thank you, Janice. Also tonight, a discovery at a Riverdale construction site. Crews uncover Indigenous remains. Just ahead, you'll hear from the forensic anthropologist called on to examine the find. But first, clear driving conditions tonight, but that will not be the case tomorrow. A special weather statement is in effect for Toronto and the GTA. A big blast of winter, about 5 to 10 centimeters on the way. Not much in the way of sunshine today, starting off our week rather great. Fortunately, not too cold out there. Also, did you like that dose of snow we got over the weekend? Well, we're moving into a very active weather pattern. More of it's on the way. A storm system is heading our way. Let's show you right now what's brewing. A live shot of our satellite radar. And there you can see the system to the south. And it is a big one. It is large. It is complex. And it is enough to prompt a winter storm warning for those to the north. We're talking north of Barrie and Cottage Country out to Ottawa. 15 to 30 centimeters of snow forecast along with some freezing rain and ice pellets. That band of white there, that is a snowfall warning. And for, mo for us in the GTA and beyond now, Hamilton and Niagara Falls under a special weather statement. We're predicting 5 to 10 centimeters of snow. It is going 
going to transition throughout the day to rain and it is going to be a much of the day event really not starting until the late morning. So, you know, when you drop the kids off at school and it will continue on the afternoon commute could definitely be a problem with this mixing treacherous slushy conditions. We're going to break it all down for you a little bit later right now looking at mild temperatures three degrees in Toronto with the wind chill feeling like one degree. Enjoy it because it is about to get messy. We will tell you what's coming our way more specifically later on in the newscast. And that kind of weather, not ideal for tenants of a downtown building who already feel left in the cold, despite being indoors. They've been without heat since mid-December, and as the temperatures drop, concern and uh, discomfort are rising. CTV's Allison Hurst joins us live from Charles Street near Church and Bloor with the details on the situation. Allison. Well, exactly right. Tenants in this building here behind me have been without heat or hot water for weeks. Some of them are still living here using space heaters to try and keep warm, while others have either opted for accommodation provided by the building management or are staying with friends and family. Tanya Osmond has swapped her house coat for a winter coat to stay warm inside her apartment. I boil water to shower. I boil water to do my dishes. Um, running space heaters and constantly juggling between outlets to make sure that we don't break or trip the breakers. The heat and hot water have been turned off in her building for weeks. It happened on December 13th that my neighbour heard the sound of uh, pipes being sawed. Osmond says she called the Technical Safety Standards Authority. On December 19th, the TSSA and Enbridge determined it was necessary to turn off the gas. There was a gas line not capped. Uh, which could have led to gas leaking into the building. There was a vent not capped, which could have resulted in a backdraft of and carbon monoxide entering the building. According to the TSSA, there were anywhere from 15 to 20 code non-compliances found by inspectors. We are doing an investigation really to understand why the equipment was left in that unsafe state in the first place. City bylaw officers have been checking on residents and assessing the building's temperature daily. City of Toronto bylaw enforcement. David Hollish's unit was less than 9 degrees Celsius when it was checked this afternoon. It's so cold, there's no hot water. Uh, I tried living here last night, but it was really too cold. Like, my fingers and feet were numb. He's been staying with friends since the gas was turned off. Building management has handed out space heaters to residents, but Hollish says he hasn't been able to get his place warm enough. Right now I have five. Um, but if I run even two of them often at the same time on anything more than low, it flips the, the breaker switches. CTV News reached out to the building for comment, but no one replied before airtime. According to emails to tenants, they will engage in legal consultation about any obligation to offer rent abatement. Until then, full rent payment remains in place. Tenants have been told the boiler will be repaired within two weeks. Property management did offer and find some accommodation for uh, tenants who chose to go with that option. And there was initially some sort of a rent relief offered for those who found their own accommodation. But that has since changed with based on emails that they sent directly to tenants saying that when the city imposed a $500 daily fine since the date that the gas was turned off. So they are now working with legal to try and determine what sort of rent abatement they will need to be uh, providing. Now, in the meantime, the TS SSA is investigating who left the broiler in that condition and why it was left in that condition at all for how long and all of those answers. And then they're going to be providing any enforcement, which could be up to prosecution. Reporting live, I'm Allison Hurst. Back to you in studio. All right. Thank you, Allison. Still ahead, signed for a cool $92 million. The Maple Leafs keep William Nylander on ice for another eight years after scoring the biggest contract in team history. We have reaction from Leaf Nation. Work has been put on hold following the discovery of human remains at an East End construction site. An anthropological study has revealed these remains could be from an ancient indigenous burial ground. And this evening, a vigil is being held at the scene. CTV's Beth McDonnell has been following this story. She joins us live from Withrow Avenue with the latest. Beth. Michelle, members of the city's indigenous community are holding a ceremony and sacred fire at the spot where the indigenous remains were found. There are a few dozen people here, including members of the community who just live nearby. They're taking an interest in this discovery. 
members of the indigenous community tonight are offering a feast to the ancestors and will be putting tobacco in the ground as a way to mark the importance of this discovery. Can we recognize Mother Earth? Touch the ground. A prayer for the ancestors. Go around that spot four times. So the firekeeper in the east, the firekeeper in the south. Before the tobacco offering is released into the pit where the indigenous bones were uncovered. A discovery connected to a people in Toronto's Riverdale neighborhood about 1,000 years ago, known as the Withrow Archaeological Site. So the remnants of those Ice Age people would have been right here on Withrow site. And uh, so they would have been the uh, ancestors of the Ojibwe. Philip Cote is a member of Moose Deer Point First Nation, an academic and city resident. He says while these remains are new, the wider site was first unearthed in the late 1800s as urban development came to the area. History is very exciting at this point for Indigenous people because there is a lot of this knowledge now rising to the surface and a lot of Indigenous people are trying to find the truth about who they are. I consider this an honour uh, to be able to respond and to treat uh, the remains accordingly and with respect. Greg Olson is the forensic anthropologist who identified the remains as Indigenous. He was brought in after city crews doing pipe work made the finding Friday and called Toronto Police. Looking at the bones themselves, they've been in the ground uh, a long, long time. I can't give you a, a proper uh, date, uh, Beth, because uh, that would mean removing some of them off site to do carbon dating, and uh, we won't do that. We won't move them from their spot. It's a story still unraveling that those living nearby are anxious to learn. I just hope that there's more information that comes out to light um, so that, you know, a proper decision can be made about it all. Um, that's where I am right now with it. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm thinking about the person who was here. City Councillor Paula Fletcher commends the workers for reporting the remains, now an opportunity to raise awareness about Toronto's past. Along the water, along the rivers, and that's where this person or these people lived, and deep respect to them. So 5,000-year-old connects it with the trade network. What will come of the remains is not yet known. A nearby plaque discusses some of the research about the Withrow site, the language is spoken, and how people lived. Cote believes in time this new discovery will also be recognized with a plaque. Forensic anthropologist Greg Olson says he also found what appears to be a spear point in the pit when he was here over the weekend. Philip Cote says this is another discovery which excites him about the future of learning about the people who were here back in the day. Reporting live, I'm Beth McDonnell. Now back to Michelle and Nathan. All right, thank you, Beth. A teenage girl is recovering tonight after being hit by a bus in Vaughan. The 14-year-old was struck by a York Region transit bus near Highway 7 and Weston Road just before 8 this morning. Police initially said the girl was in critical condition, but later indicated she only suffered minor injuries. It's unclear what led to her being struck. And a teenager was injured in an overnight shooting in Scarborough. Emergency crews were called to the pharmacy and Shepherd area around 1230 in the morning. Police say the 17 year old boy was taken to hospital with serious injuries, but has since been released. So far, there's been no word on any suspects or what led to this shooting. Toronto's police chief has issued an apology over the actions of a couple of his officers at a pro-Palestinian protest over the weekend. It was captured on video and appeared to show them handing coffee and donuts to demonstrators, and it sparked plenty of reaction. CTV's John Musselman joins us live with the details. John. Well, Nathan, what we're learning today is that this video has caused a bit of a stir, but we're also learning from sources within the Toronto Police Association that there's a bigger issue here about dealing with all these protests every weekend. Hey, I'm just saying you know what uh, who he is. There. The video shows two Toronto police officers delivering coffee and donuts to the pro-Palestinian protesters. The location is the 401 overpass near Avenue Road. In the video, the protesters say police were preventing any more demonstrators on the overpass. There were protest groups on both sides of the police line. Uh, we're not the police. Someone, came, someone has brought it for us, but the police won't let them in. So the police are now coming our little messengers with this. I don't know. Police sources say this was simply done to defuse the situation, but the decision has angered members of the Jewish community who call the weekend protests near Avenue Road hateful and intimidating. And they claim protesters are targeting the predominantly Jewish neighborhood in this area. 
one thing is to be tolerating these hate protesters, but another thing is to be uh, enabling them. And that's a, that's that is a little bit what the, the the video the footage of that looked like. Toronto Police Chief Myron Demke admits the video is concerning, and he issued an apology. Quote, I immediately convened command meetings and ordered a thorough review of the day's events and to ensure that the most effective operational planning and responses are in place. Let me be clear and unequivocal. Our commitment to keeping our city's Jewish community safe is unwavering. We are doing everything we can in the locations that have been targeted for demonstrations to uphold and enforce the law. I think it looks bad, and I get the public concern. It's like the police are supporting these protesters, and obviously they're not. Uh, but some officer made a decision at the scene while trying to de-escalate a very difficult situation. And sources with the Toronto Police Association say there is more to this story. CTV News obtained this internal memo sent to all officers on behalf of the board of directors. In this situation, our members were tasked with keeping the peace. In doing so, their acts have been portrayed in the media as being ineffectual and negligent in their duties. Nothing could be further from the truth. We are concerned with the direction provided to our members and the lack of resources that were utilized during this event. You are dealing with tumultuous situations and you deserve to be fully supported. We are actively discussing our concerns with the chief and command. The safety and reputation of our members is our priority. Please continue to take care of yourselves and each other. And the pro-Palestinian community has made it clear it's critically important for them to be out demonstrating as they call for a ceasefire. Reporting live, I'm John Musselman. I'll send it back to you. All right. Thank you, John. A sad and painful anniversary is being remembered tonight. It was four years ago, 176 people died in the downing of Ukraine Airlines Flight 752. Today, the Prime Minister joined a vigil in Richmond Hill to remember the victims, but it also came with a call for action. CTV's Raheem Ladani has the details. This is my favorite. Wearing a pin with her late husband's face as a constant reminder, Moral Gorgonpour's grief doesn't feel any lighter with each passing year. Believe it or not, it gets harder because I miss him every day more than the day before. Gorgonpour and her late husband Farid had been married just three days earlier in Iran before he boarded flight PS752, heading back to Canada where he was a PhD student at Carleton University. We had our whole lives in front of us and... Yeah, it's been four years that I'm still in denial. At the Richmond Hill Center for Performing Arts, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau attended a commemoration ceremony on the fourth anniversary of the Ukraine International Airlines flight, which was shot down on January 8, 2020. Mitra Ahmadi, 46. 176 people lost their lives, 55 of them Canadian citizens and 30 permanent residents. Committed to ensuring that the world never forgets them and that good comes from unimaginable loss. And in this case, good means holding to account the murderous regime responsible. This past June, Canada and three other countries referred the case to the International Court of Justice. Today, they said they are bringing the case before the International Civil Aviation Organization. We won't let the Iranian regime divide us and we will put maximum pressure on it. Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps shot down PS752, and Iranian officials claim they mistook the flight for a hostile target. Families of the victims continue to call on the Canadian government to designate the IRGC a terrorist organization. By each day they postpone this action, there are more, more lives are taken. The federal government says it is not opposed to adding Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps as a formal terrorist entity, but this afternoon, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau said it must be done responsibly. Raheem Ladani, CTV News. A developing story tonight, there's been an explosion at a downtown hotel in Fort Worth, Texas. Debris was scattered on the street outside the building at around 3.30 this afternoon local time. Eleven people were injured. One is in critical condition. Two others suffered serious injuries. The rest had minor injuries. Investigators believe the blast was caused by natural gas. And firefighters are still searching the building to make sure everyone is out.
go outside and I see smoke and debris outside and I got people from in front of us, everyone's outside the building checking it out. I see white smoke in the air and I mean, it was crazy. And then I hear a bunch of sirens just coming in and emergency service vehicles. And it got really scary for a little bit. People are being urged to stay away from the area. A safe area to reunite with families has been set up. There are growing concerns about a wider Mideast war following the death of a senior Hezbollah commander in an Israeli airstrike. And as tensions escalate, America's Secretary of State is back in the region looking to prevent the war from spreading. CTV's Heather Wright reports. Smoke was seen rising from southern Lebanon today after a series of airstrikes on Hezbollah targets that the group says killed one of its senior leaders. Wissam al Tali, a commander in its elite Rod 1 force, was one of several people killed. In a strike, some fear will escalate into a wider conflict. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in the region this week, trying to prevent that from happening. He has a very tricky agenda here uh, in order to keep this from making a, a, a splash into a much wider conflict, while at the same time assuring each set of allies that uh, he's really on their side. The United States has also been pressuring Israel into shifting to a less intense phase of its war against Hamas in Gaza, something Israel says its military has begun. Gaza's health ministry says more than 20,000 people, roughly 1% of the population, have been killed since October 7th. When Israel began its bombardment of Gaza in response to the brutal attacks carried out by Hamas. But it's not clear what this next phase might look like. Three people were killed and more than a dozen injured following a strike in southern Gaza today. Injured Palestinians were transported to hospital, while others tried to salvage food supplies that were being carried in a car that was damaged in the explosion. It was all for daily sustenance, says Mohammed al Qasis. There were no missiles. They weren't delivering missiles. They were unarmed people. At one of Gaza's last functioning hospitals, hundreds of patients and staff have been forced to flee as fighting surrounding the complex intensifies. Two humanitarian groups say they have pulled their staff from the hospital because of the fighting, while the WHO called the situation troubling. Israel says Hamas continually uses hospitals and other civilian facilities to hide weapons and fighters. With Israel saying it's shifting tactics, family members of those still being held in Gaza are demanding the government prioritize their release. Israel says it will not end any military activity until the remaining hostages are freed. Heather Wright, CTV News, Toronto. There was a large-scale missile barrage across Ukraine today. Four people were killed. Authorities report residential areas, commercial sites and crucial infrastructure were hit. More than 30 people were injured. Ukraine said it destroyed 18 out of 51 missiles. That's a much lower shoot-down rate than normal. It's attributed to the large number of ballistic missiles being fired, which are more difficult to intercept. In recent weeks, Russia has resumed a campaign of regular airstrikes on Ukrainian population centers far behind the lines. United Airlines says it found loose bolts and other installation issues on some of its Boeing 737 MAX 9 jets. The planes have been grounded and are being inspected after a plug covering an unused exit door blew off during an Alaska Airlines flight. CTV's Joy Malbin reports. We are learning much more about that terrifying in-flight blowout on Air Alaska. The big question, how an unused exit door, a big chunk of metal, blew off the Boeing 737 MAX 9 as it cruised over Oregon. Federal investigators combing through the plane say warning lights had come on the week before, possibly indicating a pressurization problem. There was a decision by Alaska Airlines to... Um, uh, a restriction, actually, that uh, prevented that plane uh, from being flown to Hawaii over uh, water so that it could, if, so, if some light did illuminate, it could return very quickly to an airport. And it seems the cockpit voice recorder, the so-called black boxes, offer no clues because it re-records over the data after just two hours. But investigators say the door plug, which covers and seals that exit, was found in the backyard of a school teacher's home. And that's a big part of the puzzle and could shed light on what passengers described as a frightening ordeal. I woke up to the plane just 
falling and I knew it was not just normal turbulence because the masks came down. I was really praying. I was asking God to put angels under the wings to hold us up. Some passengers reported a teenage boy had his shirt pulled off by the force. Phones were sucked out of the plane. Flight attendants trying to keep everyone safe. It's amazing no one was seriously hurt and the plane made it back safely to Portland. Federal officials have grounded about 170 of those MAX 9s worldwide, forcing Air Alaska and United Airlines here in the U.S. to cancel hundreds of flights while they investigate what went wrong. Joy Malvin, CTV News, Washington. In Ottawa, the new interim House leader is pledging to work toward finding common ground with the opposition parties. We are in a minority. We, we will always work with opposition parties to move forward with our legislation. I actually think we've uh, moved ahead with a number of very, very significant pieces of legislation uh, last year uh, throughout 2023 and into the fall, um, including some significant budgetary provisions. So these things uh, will continue to move ahead. We will continue to find, as we must, as is our responsibility, uh, try to find common ground with our friends uh, on the opposition benches. Stephen McKinnon spoke today following a private ceremony in which he was sworn in. The government whip is now the manager of the House of Commons and wants members from all parties to set a better tone. He's temporarily replacing fellow Liberal Karina Gould while she's on maternity leave. She plans to vote for bills virtually and attend cabinet and caucus meetings by phone and video. Back here at home, it's the hockey deal that has Leafs fans talking. You're looking at the highest paid player in the team's history. William Nylander inked an eight-year contract extension worth a whopping $92 million. CTV Sean Lee Thong has more on the signing and reaction from players, including Nylander himself. Stepping onto the ice, $92 million richer. A nice way to start the day for William Nylander. Yeah, it's been a process from all the from the summertime, so it's uh, nice that it's done and nowhere. Uh, I'm going to stay for the next eight years. It's a special, very special feeling. You just expect to score. Nylander's in the middle of the best year of his career, leading the team with 54 points and on pace to score over 40 goals. This extension will keep Nylander in a Leaf uniform for eight seasons after this one, saying he always wanted to be in Toronto. I mean, this has been home for me. Um, this is the longest I've ever spent in one place in my, uh, in my entire life. His average salary of $11.5 million a year is only behind Austin Matthews. For Leafs management, this contract was a top priority with GM Brad Living describing the 27-year-old as... Top player in what I believe just entering the prime of his career, so we're excited, but it's a good day for us. Nylander was drafted by the Leafs in 2014 and developed into a premier NHL player for a team looking to win now and in the future. It's a huge moment for the organization uh, because it guarantees you're not going to lose one of your most talented players for nothing. He was due to become an unrestricted free agent. TSN Leafs reporter Mark Masters says that while Nylander's talent is evident, he's also a great fit in Toronto. And this is a guy that has shown that he can handle the heat in Toronto. Uh, I've covered a lot of players over the years in Toronto, and there's been no one quite like William Nylander. At practice today, Nylander was the center of attention with teammates praising his ability. The sky's the limit. He, you know, he has the strength, he has the speed and the skill, and you know, the brain to you know, do whatever he wants. So, you know, I think that, you know, I think he'll go as far as he wants to go. And when Captain John Tavares was asked about handling the pressure of a big contract, I think he'll handle it just fine. Uh, I think we see the way he handles things and. Just the, the continued belief uh, in himself uh, to go out there and, and be a great player, be a difference maker, you know. I don't know if I've met anyone that quite has the confidence uh, like him, and I mean that uh, uh, in a very positive way. So now they can concentrate on the game on the ice. Sean Lee Thong, CTV News. Three. Coming up, we hoping a for a soft landing. A private American company's rocket launch to the moon is threatened by a fuel leak. We'll have the latest on the mission attempt. And a large storm system is heading our way, poised to impact your day tomorrow. We'll break down what to expect and when in just a few minutes. Could Ontario be in line for a major investment in a new electric vehicle plant? The reports Honda is looking at several sites, including a location near its existing plant in Alliston. As CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris reports, that has officials in this province buzzing. This sprawling Honda property in Alliston employs more than 4,000 people. 
Now word the auto giant may be eyeing this area south of Barrie for electric vehicle and battery plants, a prospect the mayor is thrilled about. It'll bring a tremendous amount of, of jobs, spin off businesses, great economic growth. Nikkei Asia reports Alliston is under consideration as Honda looks to catch up on the EV market in Canada. The company's investment could pass $18 billion. We would like to have you here. We want you here. We'll work with you to do what we can to make sure that everything goes as smooth as possible. An EV battery plant for Honda would be part of a growing list in Ontario. A Stellantis LG partnership in Windsor is due to open this year. A Volkswagen facility in St. Thomas expected to come online in 2027. But Honda's plans are on a different scale. Two and a half times the size of the of the, the Volkswagen one and uh, three and a half times the size of the Stellantis one. This auto industry player sees logic in expanding in Alliston, where Honda is already well connected. Sources of labor, uh, uh, suppliers, and they know that the infrastructure is going to be built into the area for the critical minerals that we need to put into batteries. Provincial and federal governments won't say what proposals they've seen. Canada's Minister of Science and Innovation writes in part, Reports about Honda looking to make a significant investment in Canada speaks to the quality of workforce and the strength of our industry. As for whether Canada and Ontario will pitch in, François-Philippe Champagne says, as with Stellantis and Volkswagen, we'll evaluate the project proposal in due time and act in the best interest of Canadians as well as the long term of these generational investments. Canada and Ontario have already promised over $28 billion in subsidies and tax breaks for battery plants. They're linked to output. But Honda could ask for construction cash, a more traditional funding model. The return on investment on those has been as short as two or three years. Mayor Norcross thinks it's a worthwhile investment. All levels of government need to participate. We're competing in a global economy. A Honda spokesperson says they have nothing to announce right now, that they're focused on building an EV hub in Ohio for late next year. But Nikkei reports the company wants Canadian EV facilities good to go by 2028. Siobhan Morris, CTV News. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. All right, to the forecast, most of us are back to work, back to school, the kids for sure. Mm -hmm, I have to admit, I did enjoy the lighter traffic over the past couple of weeks, but things have already changed and probably are going to get worse tomorrow with all that snow and rain coming in. We have several storm systems this week. The first one is coming our way tomorrow. So, yes, more people on the road. And then you add a nice storm to the mix, and you're definitely going to want to factor this in tomorrow. Let's have a look at our satellite radar. There's the storm system making its way north from the south. Let's break it down because it really will evolve throughout the day. So the forecast radar now, you see tomorrow morning. So 8, 8.30 in the morning, that's when the snow reaches Toronto. So maybe you drop the kids off at school. So it's the late morning commute that's really going to be impacted. If we push it forward to midday, see that line there, the pink and the green. So the snow is in blue, the rain is in green. So about the heaviest stuff is coming your way midday. So if you're on the road at this that point, take note. And then by 3.30, we're transitioning to the rain, heavy at times as well. We're talking 5 to 10 centimeters of snow and then 10 to 15 millimeters of rain. And then it is going to continue on. And really by 10, 11 o'clock tomorrow night is when that system pushes out. So much of the day is going to be impacted by the storm system. You got the snow moving in heavy at times in the morning after eight o'clock. Snow and rain mix happens in the afternoon. And think about that. The conditions will be treacherous, slushy. It is not going to be a fun drive and you will want to drive accordingly. And then we're dealing with the rain heavy at times in the evening. Uh, temperature wise, the lows minus one feeling colder with the wind chill, but this is actually above seasonal tomorrow's high two degrees. So definitely mild for this time of year. That's why the system is multi pronged and we're dealing with rain as well. So it breaks down like this tomorrow. We have snow and we have rain a large dose of it. The high two by Wednesday. We're out of that storm system. Yes, there's flurries and showers possible. A little bit of a mix, but not really an issue. The high three degrees. There's the chance of flurries, maybe even some snow 
snow on Thursday as well. We're at the freezing mark Friday. It's calm, but it starts to cool down the high minus one. And then there's that other storm system I was talking about for the weekend. Friday night into Saturday, possible more than 10 centimeters of snow. We really won't know until we get closer, but it's cool. So that means the snow that we do get versus the system that we're dealing with um, tomorrow is probably going to stick around on the weekend. There won't be as much accumulation tomorrow because it's mild and then just some flurries for Sunday and Monday. It cools down even more, but look just clouds. So if you're looking for sun, hmm, none of it. The Golden Globes were handed out last night at the Beverly Hilton in California to look back at some of the big winners and losers and the backlash directed at the host. The health risks faced by frontline firefighters have been well documented. It's something an Ontario cancer researcher who's also a firefighter has been investigating. As CTV health reporter Pauline Chan tells us, he hopes to better protect those people who protect us. Jim Petrick has been a biomedical researcher at Guelph University for almost 25 years, and through that time, he's also been a volunteer firefighter. I never really imagined that, that those two you know, areas of my life would converge so powerfully as they have. His lab work is focused on manipulating the blood vessels that feed cancerous tumors, not destroying them, but counterintuitively strengthening them. What we find is if we reestablish a, a good blood supply to the tumor, then when, when uh, the patient receives therapy, such as chemotherapies or immunotherapies, we've shown that we can get a 500% a increase in the amount of therapy that's taken up into the tumor. Ovarian cancer and pancreatic, two cancers that are notoriously hard to detect and treat, have been his main targets. Our, our hope is that um, we have the opportunity to go to clinical trial in the next year. Petrick's cancer research coincides with his advocacy for firefighters who are known to have high rates of cancer. Up to a 9% increase in the likelihood of developing cancer, and then unfortunately up to a 14% higher incidence of dying from cancer uh, compared to the general public. He says what's now recognized is that wearing masks and such is not enough. What we didn't understand is that the whole time that we're in that contaminated environment, those, those chemicals are being absorbed into our protective equipment. While he hopes his research finds better ways to treat cancer, his other hope is that earlier screening and better workplace practices for firefighters will help avoid cancer and reduce the need for regressive treatments. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Rising from the ashes of controversy, the Golden Globe Awards returned and so did the stars. But that doesn't mean it wasn't without controversy, from the host and his jokes that landed poorly to who did and didn't win. CTV's Andrea Case joins us now with a recap of the night. Andrea. Michelle and Nathan, good evening. Yes, people may have been wishing Ricky Gervais returned as the host. Ironically, he won the inaugural stand-up comedy award and was not there to accept it. Speaking in the Blackfeet language, Golden Globe Best Actress winner Lily Gladstone of Killers of the Flower Moon is the first Indigenous woman to win the award. This is for every little res kid, every little urban kid, every little native kid out there who has a dream, who is seeing themselves represented and our stories told by ourselves in our own words um, with tremendous allies. But the night's big winner in the film category was... Oppenheimer! The film won five major awards, including Best Picture, Supporting Actor for Robert Downey Jr., Best Actor for Cillian Murphy, and Best Director, Christopher Nolan. History was also made on the television side. Ali Wong. The comedian-turned-leading lady is the first woman of Asian descent to be nominated and win in this category. Some disappointment for Barbie, but it wasn't shut out completely, winning Best Original Song, What Was I Made For, by Phineas O'Connell and Billie Eilish. Um, and, you know, it was exactly a year ago almost that we were shown the movie, and I was very, very miserable and depressed at the time. And writing that song kind of saved me a little bit. And the success of the billion-dollar box office juggernaut was recognized in a new category, Best Cinematic Achievement. Last but not least, thank you so much to the Golden Globes for creating an award that celebrates movie fans. This 
is a movie about Barbie, but it's also a movie about humans. The stars returned and the splashy production was back, and the candid shots of the guests made for great gossip. The Golden Globes, under new management, now run by Dick Clark Productions, after a scandal plagued the Hollywood foreign press, and it was disbanded a few years ago. Golden Globes journalists, thanks for changing your game, therefore changing your name. Salute. As for the host, Joel Coy, it was a rough night. Yo, I got the gig 10 days ago. You want a perfect monologue? Yo, shut up. I'm still cringing, still cringing. Well, in a post-show interview, Coy said he didn't think it was so bad. And there was so much more to the night. Red carpet interviews before the show, parties afterwards. E-Talk will have so much more tonight at 7, right after CTV News Toronto. The Stars Tonight is brought to you by Lastman's Bad Boy, court-approved liquidation sale. It is my view that anyone who would go to these lengths is not a one-off. Updating our top stories, days after a Jewish-owned deli in North York was set on fire, two City of Toronto officials are calling on the federal government to investigate the incident as an act of terror. The blaze broke out at International Delicatessen near Steeles in Kiel early Wednesday morning. The words Free Palestine were seen spray painted on the outside of the building. I tried living here last night, but it was really too cold. Like, my fingers and feet were numb. With a snowstorm heading our way and frigid temperatures settling in, tenants at a downtown apartment are demanding action, claiming they've been without heat or hot water for weeks. The Technical Standards and Safety Authority says the gas had to be turned off after investigators found 15 to 20 code violations. I mean, this has been home for me. Um, this is the longest I've ever spent in one place in my, uh, in my entire life. The Maple Leafs have signed William Nylander to an eight-year, $92 million contract extension. The deal has an average annual value of $11.5 million and includes a full no-move clause for all eight seasons. The 27-year-old is currently tied for fifth in points in the NHL. On the markets, the Canadian dollar is trading just a touch higher at 74.88 U.S. Oil declined three bucks to a tad below 71 dollars U.S. a barrel, and the TSX gained 137 points to end the day at 21,074. It was a hugely successful relationship lasting nearly three decades, but now Tiger Woods and Nike are going their separate ways. Wood says, over 27 years ago, I was fortunate to start a partnership with one of the most iconic brands in the world. The days since have been filled with so many amazing moments and memories. If I started naming them, I could go on forever. Wood signed a five-year deal worth $40 million when he turned pro. His latest contract in 2013 was for a reported $200 million. Nike says it was money well spent. And they add, Tiger, you challenge your competition, stereotypes, conventions, the old school way of thinking. You challenge the entire institution of golf. You challenged us, and most of all, yourself. And for that challenge, we're grateful. Wood's agent says it's time for the next chapter. The former world number one is optimistic. He can play once a month this year, starting next month in Los Angeles. Just ahead, it could be the first lunar landing in more than 50 years, but it is in jeopardy because of a fuel leak. Details on the moon mission's major setback. Just ahead. Finally tonight, it's the first mission of its kind in more than 50 years and another out-of-this-world moment for space exploration. A lunar lander is making its way to the moon tonight, but as CTV's Scott Lightfoot reports, the launch and the journey there isn't exactly a smooth one and liftoff of the first United Launch Alliance Vulcan rocket. In the early hours of this morning, a mission to the moon left Cape Canaveral, Florida, the first American attempt to reach the lunar surface in more than 50 years. This is the first use of this new Vulcan Centaur rocket from United Launch Alliance. And so it's an important step forward when we look at the privatization of the space race. A crewless Vulcan rocket making the journey into space, the first of several private attempts to make a soft landing on the moon's surface this year. On board the rocket, a robotic lunar lander built by U.S. company Astrobotic. The 1.2-ton lander, dubbed Peregrine, is about the size of a garden shed and contained inside several scientific instruments, as well as the cremated remains and DNA of 70 people, including the creator and several cast members of the original Star Trek series. 
their ashes and their DNA are going to join together and be launched out. Humanity is going where no one has gone before. But whether or not the lunar lander would make it to where it was going came into question not long after launch, when an issue was discovered that was preventing the lander from pointing its solar panels at the sun, jeopardizing its ability to recharge its onboard batteries. That problem was fixed not long after, but another more serious one was then discovered, a critical loss of propellant, putting the future of this mission in jeopardy. The U.S. is talking about sending humans to the moon, and so they would like to make sure they've got everything in place. So the mission here is pretty straightforward. It's just really to stick the landing. If the problems are fixed, the Peregrine lunar lander is expected to touch down in February. But by that time, another U.S. company hopes to already be on the moon's surface, launching later, but landing one day earlier than Peregrine Mission 1. Scott Lightfoot, CTV News. All right, to the forecast, we've been talking about this for a few days now. We know this storm is on the way. Mm -hmm. A storm is coming. Let's break it down for you. The system making its way for tomorrow, prompting a special weather statement for southern Ontario. A winter storm warning to the north, 5 to 10 centimeters for Toronto of snow, much less by Lake Ontario, 20 to 33 millimeters of rain. So late morning, the snow moves in, really peaking midday. And then in the afternoon, mid-afternoon, it transitions to rain. It really won't move out until 10, 11 tomorrow. Wednesday, it'll be behind us. Just some flurries and showers. The high three degrees. Chance of flurries or snow Thursday. Friday calms down, but it starts to get colder. Minus one the high. And then we're expecting another storm system in time for your weekend. And it is much colder. We're expecting much more accumulations. But we will cross that bridge when we get to it. If you wanted snow, guess what? We got it most days this week. All right. Good news for some. Mm -hmm. That's it for us. But be sure to join Omar Sachedina tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Alman with our next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a great night.